Hi. Uh, good afternoon. We're here for Getting Your House in Order, Business and Legal Considerations for Emergency Preparedness. So that's the session you're in if you were expecting something else. Welcome. Uh, this will be an excellent session, I'm sure. I'm looking forward to it. Uh, a couple of basic things to note. As you see the exit sign, we've got exits both ways. Restrooms are back there. Um, the panelists will introduce themselves, and so we can go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. I'll make it quick. Uh, Nathan Gray, I work for the Richards Group, uh, specifically in the commercial lines department. So I do business insurance, and I'll get more into that in a bit. Good afternoon. Deborah Budrio, I'm the advisor for Vermont Small Business Development Special. Development centers, sorry, I just walked in the door if you saw, I, I was saying that I was born and brought up here and still forget every summer that they're going to put all the construction projects <laughs> in one you know, group as I'm trying to get a two and a half hour drive in actually two and a half hours, so I excuse my lateness. I'm going to speak first just so you know what's going to happen and then we're going to um, move out to the panel, so please, we're a small enough group. I feel like we can interrupt at any time. We can, we can change up if we need to. So let's get your questions answered. That's the most important thing. So I agree with Deborah. My name is uh, Brian Bailey. I'm here with the Vermont Law and Graduate School. I'm also a solo practitioner uh, here in town in Berlin. Um, but today I'm here on behalf of the law school. Um, and so we're going to I'm a lawyer. We're going to be answering legal questions as needed. And we also have with us. Hello, I'm Devin Brennan. I'm a student clinician in the Small Business Law Clinic at Vermont Law and Graduate School. I'm thankful to be here, and hopefully I can answer any of your questions. OK, hand it over to you. Can we just get a sense of who's in the room? And I can't sit down, so I seriously apologize in advance. It just doesn't work for me. Can you just tell who's here? Who are we talking to? Deborah, do you want me to hand these out? Um, no, not for a okay. second, but thank you. I will ask you, though, when I do need yeah. to. Uh, so I'm Kate. I work at a place called Common Ground Center in Sparksboro. We are a nonprofit family camp retreat center. Um, I manage all the events and the site and facilities there. Perfect. That's the right amount of time. Quick. Yes. <laughs> I'm Meg Campbell. I work with the Preservation Trust of Vermont. We're a statewide nonprofit. Okay. Preservation Community Development Thanks. Grover, Executive Director of the Colin Hubbard Library, uh, Public Library and Cultural Hub in Montpelier. We had about $2 million in damage in last uh, July's floods. Hi, I'm Rebecca Marzlack Kelly. I'm the General Manager of Weston Theater Company. We flooded in 2023 as well. I want to ask how many of you also flooded in Irene, which is where I got my waiters, my, my head boots. Yeah, thanks. Uh, hi, I'm Jesse Keel. I'm a preservation specialist with the Northeast Document Conservation Center. Okay. Elizabeth Malone from Vermont Humanities. I'm the director of finance and admin, and I administer the flood recovery grants um, for a couple of <coughs> folks that are in this room. Um, and uh, also, I take care of our facility that relies a lot on a cell phone. Um, I'm LOI Stanforth. I currently work for Vermont After School. We just had a $40,000 grant for uh, Youth Third Spaces in Barrie. We helped create the teen space up there. And I'm currently creating a Boldwood Socially Engaged School for the Arts here in Barrie. Thanks. I'm Fred Pond. I'm a college librarian. And I chase after old film and moving image footage in Vermont. Okay, um, I'm Patricia Reed. I work for the Lake Champlain Maritime Museum, which is both a museum and a youth education center. Um, we were fortunate not to be affected by the 2023 or 2024 flood events, but we are um, working on all of our policies and procedures okay. here to learn. Okay. Uh, I'm Zach, I'm the operations manager at the Vermont Studio Center. You guys got the slam? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Cab Papa One. I'm from the Temple of Hip Hop. Although I live in Vermont, I primarily work in the Bronx, New York, and Newark, New Jersey. We're a cultural non for profit organization. We also hold the legal documentation for hip hop as a culture verified by UNESCO. Cool. Wow. Well, welcome, everybody. Who are you, Tom? <laughs> I'm Tom. 
Rick Murdo. I'm an assistant state librarian for information and access and also a member of the Back Darn Steer Steering Committee. Great. Thanks for inviting us. Do we need this? Yes. 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 Okay. Then I will keep doing it. So I'm going to switch up completely what I was going to do because I just want to say Vermont Small Business Development Centers are a nonprofit organization funded by the federal government. We offer one-on-one, -on -one, confidential, no-cost business advising into small business. It's national. If you have relatives in other states, it's a great program. We're everywhere. But we are not allowed under this administration to work with nonprofits. Now, Amy knew that when she asked me to come here. We thought there might be some businesses in the room. I have a, I worked for a while in nonprofit myself. So I'm still going to tell you all of the same things, but I'm going to put some caveats on it. So right now, Amy saw me speak about six weeks ago. Amy and I have worked together for the 14 years. I've been in this job in various ways. And she saw me speak at a FEMA conference on this very subject and asked if I would come here and do it. So what we're working on right now is trying to get businesses, and in, in your case, nonprofits, to look at how you become resilient in the face of this now happening to us again and again and again. And I don't know, you could tell me how much the publicity about how hard Vermont has been hit affects your day-to-day -day jobs. But for my small businesses, when it makes the Washington Post that Lamoille County is the hardest hit county in the United States by natural disaster this year, it does not help. So we had Irene, and then we had the flood of the previous summer and then this summer's floods. And we're now changing the narrative about what's happening in Vermont and how often we're having to deal with it. If you throw a worldwide pandemic in the middle of that, the reason we're doing the project we're doing right now is that we felt like what we were hearing from our small businesses and again, if this isn't relevant, please raise your hand and I'll keep moving because I could talk for days. What we found was that there was just a sort of overriding feeling of loss of agency. Like everything they did to mitigate, not physically, but financially and staff-wise and their business operations, everything they did to mitigate and they just get started to get a m momentum, something else would hit them. So what we were seeing was, uh, we are continuing to see, frankly, is a real sense of ennui, a sense of I don't know what to do in any situation because everything I do seems like there's some act of God or whoever you want to blame it on. But it's not me. It's not me who was trying to do the right thing or me trying to do something. Add to that the financial implications with the level of debt, which I'm sure you guys are seeing in reduced donations, I would guess. Um, just because when people are focused elsewhere, it's hard to ask them for money. I remember that part. So we said, how do we get people to really look at what they need to do so that they can stay resilient. We were calling this, it will be done by the end of the year, with all the fates willing. We started calling it the Business Resiliency Guide. And then we went, that's a kind of terrible name. So we're still working. <laughs> the title's a work in progress. How does resiliency sound to you? What do you, when you? When you hear the word resiliency, what happens to your, you know, to your stomach, to your temperature, to your mental state. Does it make you go crazy, or does it make you feel like there's hope? Hopeful. Hopeful. Okay, good. I'm going to say the opposite. Okay, good. Uh, I think when you've been through so many consecutive things, like complex PTSD almost, resiliency is not the thing that you want to be called anymore. Mm. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like, that's great, but where's, like, what does that translate to, you know? 
And I'll tell you, one of the reasons we're probably not going to use the word resiliency, at least in the title, is that all of our, our um, non-English speaking clients are telling us that there is no single word in any language but our own that equals that. So any other language, it's going to take a phrase or, in some cases, a couple of sentences to translate that. And that seems prohibitive and not the place that we certainly want to be in. But what we think about, when we're thinking about resiliency, we're thinking about that ability to, how do you, in the face of what keeps coming at us, how do you stay nimble? How do you take the pauses that you need? I'm about to retire, I'll be honest with you. I'm retiring at the end of December. I've been doing this for 14 years. I'm now going to enter the third chapter of my life. I'm kind of I'm getting more and more excited all the time. Not that I don't love you and not that I don't love doing this because I do, but it feels like the right thing. If I, when I get asked what is the best piece of advice I've given in the 14 years I've been doing this job with hundreds and hundreds of small business, it's and when did I feel most effective? It's when I've gotten people to pause when I've gotten people to stop, and this is from the day after Irene to today. It's the word that I learned with my counties were the hardest hit in Irene. It's the word that I've learned to try to use the most, to try to say, let's stop, let's pause, let's take a breath, let's figure out where we are, and then let's go forward. Because what's happened in our small business community, and again, hopefully, hopefully not for you, but maybe for you, is the immediate response, of course, to any, anything like a flood or a pandemic, is to, is to get back to that wonderful word we use all the time, normal. And you'll do anything to get back there. And the reality is that's never going to be the same. And so how do we... How do we take account for everything that's going on? And then how do we prepare for the next time? When I was on a panel in New Orleans after Irene, and I had written this, which you may certainly have a copy of. This is the, this is the disaster recovery guide. This is what happens the day after the disaster hits. I've got more in my car. They had done a study in New Orleans, the SPDC, with the University of Louisiana and one of the major insurance companies. And these guys are going to, Nate's going to start shaking his head right now. He's heard me say this before because we've been on panels together. But they did 119 small businesses that had been hit by Gustav, the BP oil spill, and Katrina to see if they had the proper insurances in place for the next disaster. And guess how many of the 119 did? No, a little better than that, not a lot, three. Three, and the response was, of course, it'll never happen to me again. Well, as the, as the New Orleans SPDC says, New Orleans just needs a really good bath every couple of years. And if you've ever gone in, if you've ever flown into New Orleans, you go, whoever built this city did not have the, you know, the, the height of a, the viewpoint of a plane because it's 11, it's 11 feet above sea level, the entire city. Hi, Amy. So it's, you know, it's going to get a bath whether it wants one or not. So we said, how do we get people over that hump? Because if we start talking about disaster preparedness, it's like asking all of you, would you like to sit here? We'll talk about disaster preparedness for 15 minutes. Then we're going to give you all a shot of Novocaine. We're going to do root canals for every single one of you. Free. Free, but we're going to do root canals. That and it clears out, if we can get people in the room in the beginning. So we started saying, what would work? How do we get people? To be resilient, and part of resiliency is to prepare for the next disaster. And how do we get them through that process to feel like they've regained some agency over this situation that feels like they have none in? So we started this. 
And you'll see that it has no name. So we could hand these out now if sure. somebody wanted That's to do good. that. You'll see it has no name because I've taken the name off it. Because again, I agree. I think there's, I don't like the word. We started saying, what would happen if you looked at the skill sets that are required to run a business? They're the same skill sets you need to run a nonprofit, to do your jobs. What would, what would it look like if we took those, those skill sets, and there are, scarily, 33 of them we've identified. It's the skill sets I talk to my small businesses about all the time. What if we said, understanding where you were in relationship to those skill sets is the first and best step to keep yourself nimble and in as much control as you possibly can be in. So that's this diagram. And what does that do? I'm going to show you what the skill sets are. What does that do? There are three groups. Operations, financial, and marketing. Sometimes we call it leadership. I may have made a mistake, again, because this is a work in progress of whether I call it operations or leadership. But it's the day-to-day -day running and also, this, in addition to the day-to-day, -day, the strategic, long-term future planning. Financial and marketing. What would happen if you knew where you and your organization stood in relationship to these skill sets? Well, what happens is in the short term, when you shore these up, then you get a more profitable or better running nonprofit. And here's what I learned in nonprofits. You guys already know this. If you don't run it like a business, it's not gonna, it's, it doesn't have any, it, it, it can't, st it won't stay. It won't be productive. It won't get funding. It won't do anything. So you get more profitability or better run bottom line that keeps you healthy and going forward. You get a happier staff. If you actually own it or you're the executive director, I guarantee you, you will sleep better, at least some of the time. And you'll have more satisfied customers, or in your case, more satisfied people who need your services. That's what happens in the short term. In the short and long term, you also have the ability to withstand, to navigate, to recover from, and to pivot, and even thrive. I've had some people who have used the the flood to actually change their business model entirely and they are in better shape, in, whether it's in the face of a disaster or an opportunity. I think both things, they sit on opposite ends of the spectrum, but you have to be prepared in the same way. Because when we looked at the disasters and threats, and you don't even have to look at them all, you know what they are, we started going, oh, well, that'll be nice if we start talking about COVID and and I don't know about you, but I'm still having businesses close right now because the majority of their staff has COVID. I've had two in the last month. So knock on, cases in Vermont up again. Um, are we all used to it? Yes, are any one of us sitting here in a mask? No. Okay, oh, good, good girl, good girl. Stand in front of the camera and say, I am, no. <laughs> um, the list is long, so rather than focus on those, let's focus on the skill sets. All right, let's pass this one out. Thanks. You can pass the other one out at the same Good time. Girl. Oh, you've got everything? Yep. You're so efficient. Thank you so much. That's why he's a lawyer and I'm a business advisor. He doesn't waste time. I'm going to put a lot of plugs in for the Vermont Law School today. Um, and you guys work with nonprofits, yes? Do, yeah. OK, good. Yep. We started in working with them at the beginning of COVID. We got extra money as an organization like other organizations got. And rather than hire a lot of staff for whom we were not going to be able to continue to keep going because we knew we were going to go back to our pre-COVID grant amount and that that was a one-time hit, we were never going to get it again. Instead, we started looking at the areas that we felt people 
small businesses were going to need our help the most. And we knew that there were going to be a lot of legal considerations. And we were worried at that point that the level of bankruptcies was going to skyrocket. So we started working with the Vermont Law Center on a program that allowed us to bring our clients to them as a consultation, not a, I don't even think we called it a consultation. It wasn't, you couldn't get actually legal advice, but a lot of small businesses, and again, maybe you and your staff feel this way, are hesitant to go to a lawyer because they A, don't know what questions to ask, B, their neighbor's sister's cousin went and spent $40,000 before the problem ever got solved. That's the same neighbor's sister's cousin's daughter who got the $75,000 grant to start their business, their for-profit business. Um, they're all, you know, we w I've never met them. I keep saying, bring that person to my office so I can find out how they did that, because if it's really true, because of course, Grants aren't for for-profit businesses, nor, frankly, having done this for 14 years and also run a nonprofit, do I think they should be? So I, I don't, people don't get a lot of sympathy from me when they go, well, but don't, doesn't, don't people want me as a single woman to run my own business or as a, you know, a single dad with a this and this, want me to run my own? Yes, but this is an actual country in which you need to decide to do that yourself, and that's okay and figure it out, and we'll help you figure it out. So we started working with them and getting people prepared for those conversations, and it was fantastic. And that has expanded into the program that they'll talk about today that you should know that you can access because it's pretty phenomenal. So here are the skill sets. Here's how I use this thing. I don't, I'm not gonna go through all 33. God, you really would want the Novocaine for a root canal. <laughs> I use this document almost as much as anything else when I work with small business because if you don't have some concept of this, so if you look at this as a level of practical knowledge and you go down this list and you've got none, then, then we need to think about something else. If, you've, if you're competent, if you feel like, yeah, I could, I could either, I could do it myself or I, I know enough that I could manage someone, to do it, or I know enough that I could hire a subcontractor to do it, or it's advanced and I can do it, no problem, I'm, I've, I've got this. I use this in a variety of ways. In terms of resiliency, this is how I'd like you to use it. I do it on myself once a year. I do it on, I'd have my staff do it on themselves once a year. Every time I went to hire someone, I'd do it again. I have my business owners who are hiring their first employee do themselves again. Why? Because you hire for the places that you've checked none. We love to hire ourselves over and over again. We, it makes us feel really good. It's really comfortable. It makes the workplace better. Warren Buffett's famous for saying, if you have a partnership and you t both of you come in every day and it's a love fest, you can't believe how wonderful it is to work with somebody who thinks the same way you do, who views the world, who has the, fire one of you. One of you's totally redundant. <laughs> you don't need to rehire yourself. You wanna always hire for the same ethics, for the same, viewpoint, but you don't want to hire for the same skill set. So I have companies that'll call me and they'll be like, we're in real trouble and I'll go in and I'll, this is one of the first exercises I do. Let's see where everybody lies. And it's a marketing firm and everybody's got all the marketing ones on the back page. Everybody's got them. They've got stars in it. They've drawn, you know, they've drawn something because they're real creative and they don't want me to just think they're going to hit the box with a check. And I get over to financial and it's like bookkeeping, none, accounting, none, state and federal taxes, none. And then strategic planning, none, personality. Okay, there's the problem. We've got a whole group of creatives who's having a blast, but there's no structural or organizational part of this business going on. And frankly, it also happens in nonprofits. I've seen this happen a lot, where you've got to get somebody in there going, what the hell were you thinking? Or did you ever ask 
the people that you're serving? There was a period where we could work with nonprofits. And I had a couple who, I worked in Brattleboro. I work in Brattleboro still for one of my districts. You can throw a stone in Brattleboro, and I don't mean to be disrespectful, and you can hit a massage therapist, a yoga teacher, or a nonprofit. <laughs> it's just, it's, I mean, I, you know, people would call and go, I'm starting a new business. Oh, God. <laughs> I'm going to be a yoga teacher, but I also do Reiki. Okay, good. <laughs> good. So glad. No. So I understand this, but for you, you simply have to take all of the language that I use about customers, if I use that, and turn it into you know, the people that you serve. Who do you serve? What do they need? I had one woman who decided to run. She had a really good idea, actually. It was an interesting idea. And I hope I'm not speaking out of turn. I don't think she's in the room. So if she is, she doesn't like me anyway. So she probably already would have left. Because I don't mince words if you're sitting in my office. Because we're a free service. And you know I've got people waiting. So because one, one way to get a lot of clients is just to offer everything free. People will come, um, at least the first time. Um, was going to go to farmer's markets and offer all of the people there who had produce and, and product for sale that was food oriented was going to offer them a reduced rate. And it's true, most of those farmers markets are going to, those, most of those farmers are going to take it home and put it in the pig pen. That's what they're going to do with it. They can't resell it. They don't have farm stands of their own usually. And it's now been on the truck out in the sun. It's whatever. So they, they do, they, they feed it to their livestock. It's a good idea. And then she was going to put that in a mini farmer's market the next day or that evening and was going to offer it to lower income families at a much reduced rate. But the price of admissions into that is that you had to take cooking classes to learn how to cook it. And the cooking classes were going to be on Saturday mornings at 11 o'clock. Because what lower income mothers needed was to learn how to cook kale because they needed to understand that they needed to feed their children better. Just line up the insulting number of things in that sentence. First of all, the assumption that low-income mothers don't want to feed their children well. Then the assumption that low-income mothers can come to a kale cooking class at 11 o'clock on Saturday morning because they're not already working their second job or their husband is. And why are they shopping at Walmart? They're shopping at Walmart because they can do everything with the kids in the cart at 10 o'clock at night. So don't make that assumption. So I said to her, have you ever asked any of those mothers, A, if they already feed their children kale and if they already know how to cook it? Well. You have a high opinion of, no, you have a low opinion of that group of people. So who, what your customer needs and wants is imperative for small business, it's imperative for you guys. That's one of the ways of running, running things more like a business. But So when you're about to hire someone, when you're about to add a new objective, when you're about to do the strategic plan for the next year, when you're about to write the next grant, Pull this out, do it, do everybody. See where the holes are and address the holes. And you can learn these things in a bunch of places and you know, you know how to get the information and there's lots of things, but know where you stand against these and denying that they need to be done is, is a little you know, head in the sand. What happens when you do these? This happens. This is the disaster preparedness checklist. It's long. I left blanks in the back. There are, and we're adding some additional, we're adding some additional checklists because now we have um, AI, both the positives and the negatives. The negatives would be on this list. Um, the real effects of social media, negative, positive, the negatives need to be on this list and addressed. But if you actually do this, then you have actually checked off by doing this, 
you have actually shored up all of those skill sets. If you look down this list, which is not what's usually in these last columns, what's usually in these last columns is who's going to do it by when, and is it done, is how I usually <coughs> use this checklist. When people started calling me at the beginning of COVID and complaining about the federal government's response to this, to COVID, and the state's response to COVID, I said, so you were ready? You had your disaster preparedness checklist complete. You had everything checked off. Well, Deborah, no. How could I possibly have done that? Then how could the state and federal government have possibly done that? Nobody funds disaster preparedness. You think congression, you think people get elected to public office by going in and saying, they do like the first you know, five days after a flood, but they don't, six months after a flood, get elected by saying, let's spend all our money on infrastructure. Because it's not sexy. There's nothing sexy about this. There's nothing fun about it. There's nothing that's going to get you elected again. But it's going to get you prepared. I'm going to stop there. You've heard enough of my voice. If I could encourage you, though, to use these sheets to think about the, the path to being nimble, whether, and look, I think being nimble and then taking the pause, having your ducks all in a row and taking the pause means that you can decide what you're supposed to do next. And we know that natural disasters result in a lot of small businesses going out of business. We know, because we work with these guys, that they were going out of business before. The majority of them were hanging on by a thread anyway. And so they simply cannot assume more debt to try to get out of it. That's just a bad, bad business decision. But some go out because it is the aha moment that goes, why would I do this again? Why would I, I was ready to go on to the next thing or I was ready. So sometimes those big events give you the opportunity to look at something in an entirely different way. To go, wow, maybe we do need to take this disaster or this pandemic or this and figure out how do we deliver services differently? Do we deliver the same service? It allows you to stop and ask the big questions if you pause long enough to do that. And you don't just do the knee-jerk reaction of, and look, I have made myself not very popular here in this state because I have said <laughs> to governors, stop with the Vermont strong, stop with the, you know, we're all the, with the damn license plates and all of that because that just puts inordinate amount of pressure on the people who need to stop and take a take a beat. You know, if I, I had a business that the governor stood in front of who could have walked away, they were close to retirement age, they could have walked away, they had enough insurance, they would have been able to pay all of their bills, they would have walked away with a lovely retirement. And instead, because the governor kept standing when they, he came to their town in front of their business, we can't lose places like this. These kinds of places need to come back. They're the heart and soul of the community. They felt so much pressure, they went into a million dollars of debt. Who's paying that debt? Not the governor, not the state, not the town. They are. So think about that the next time you just go, you know, we want to support our local businesses. Please don't get me wrong and know that I'm not saying that. But if you don't take the pause, you don't know what the next right decision is. So just, if, if you get anything from this, figure out where you are. Use this skill set as a real management opportunity for your own nonprofits. Look at who your staff is, who you are, what do you need to know. We use it at, at our organization as our professional development plan. Because I've been doing this, I'm 72 years old in a couple of months, which is why I'm retiring, because I think it's time. Um, and, and also, I don't understand AI, and I need to understand AI, and I need to understand how AI is going to do you, and I'm like, do I really want to learn this? I'm not sure I do. 
I got a lot of other things I want to do. So I'm going to stick my head in the sand and let, my, let some younger people figure that out for you guys. I lost my train of thought because I'm 72 years old. No, that's not true. I lost my train of thought because I rushed here. What was I saying? Somebody take a beat. Me, I should take a beat. <laughs> yeah, you're fine. And I am, I promise. Use this, so I'll go back to where I was hopefully going. Use this to assess yourself. We do it for our own professional development. That's what I was saying. I would go like way past the nun column on AI. I've had two or three days of training now, and I still have no idea what they're talking about. I sort of do, but I don't really know what it means in terms of what it means for you guys day to day, and that's what we need to figure out right now. I know it enough to understand that we're going to have to have businesses understand this so that they are competitive. You guys are going to have to understand it so that you remain competitive when you use it, when you don't use it, when it's, when it's, you know, when it's ethical, when it's not ethical. I mean, so many of those questions have not been answered. Do I want to see somebody attempt to write the next Pride and Prejudice? God, no. But do I want you to use it to write 30 days of social media posts, which are going to last in the universe for 30 seconds when they go up? Yes, I do. Because it's going to save you so much time. And, and time that you can use to be with the people who need you rather than doing whatever you need to do to keep your profile up for when you fundraise. Let's, let's face it, that's what that's about. You know, so I get it. We need to do certain things, but there are certain things for which social media that are transient and, and you create a bot that does what you need it to do and you make sure you look at everything. Because, you know, the one thing social, I mean, you probably know more about AI than I do, but it hallucinates. If you ask AI to give you, to write a blog for you and to give you four sources, and you get four you know, websites back, you better check those four websites because if it didn't find them, it got, it's gonna make them up for you because that's what it wants to do. It wants to please you still. And we're okay as long as it still wants to please us. So you have to check those um, four websites to see if they actually exist. And the first one that doesn't come up, you gotta ditch that blog and start again because they made up everything else in there probably too. So you can't use that you know, ethically. To, so you just have to be really careful. I'm going off on a tangent. I'm going to stop. These guys are going to talk about, look, insurance is outrageously expensive. He's not going to, it's not going to, and it's getting more and more expensive. Flood insurance is almost as complicated, I think, as trying to figure out what you need to do when you actually do apply for Medicare, which I will tell you is also <laughs> a full-time job. These guys are going to talk about the legal aspects. We're going to open it up to questions after they're through. So start writing down what your questions are, and, and let's use the, time, the rest of the time for that. Thank you very much for letting me talk. I appreciate your attention. Next. Hi, everyone. Uh, again, Nathan Gray. I work at the Richards Group. I am uh, part of the Commercial Lines team, so I specialize in business insurance, uh, for-profit, non-profit, uh, just like everyone in Vermont and New Hampshire. I am a generalist. Uh, small, medium, large contractors, uh, local theaters, schools, all of it. Um, and yeah, I guess we are in the business of worst case scenarios. Uh, yeah, <laughs> keeps me up at night. Hope it does you too. Uh, so, uh, I, I guess, uh, I, bringing the insurance lines, I guess I will pick up on, on what Deborah said last. Yes, uh, it is getting more and more uh, expensive. So plenty of it has leveled out. Uh, I don't know if, if any of you carry cyber insurance. Uh, a few years ago, right, we were seeing 30% increases, 300% increases year over year. Um, that, that's flattened out. Same with uh, directors and officers, that's pretty much flattened out. But the big ones, uh, property insurance is through the roof uh, and, and we don't see an end in sight. It, it looks like we've crested the top of the mountain, 
We're on the other side. How long it takes to get down the other side is another question. Um, and it will depend on how many more disasters happen. Yep. Yeah, uh, yeah. In my inbox yesterday, I saw you know the headline. You know, new wildfires in California raise questions about the price uh, and availability of insurance. Yes, indeed. Um, so yeah, uh, we'll see how long the back the back end of this mountain is. Uh, flood insurance too, very expensive. Uh, and you know, a couple of years ago, so so most mostly flood insurance is placed through uh, NFIP, the National Flood Insurance Program, through FEMA. Um, if you've ever experienced a loss and you need flood insurance. That is where you're going. Um, there are private markets. Sometimes they are uh, less expensive. Sometimes they even have a little better coverage. But they are only for, again, businesses, nonprofits who have never experienced uh, a flood-related loss before. I've heard whispers that there are private markets that will take you if you've had a loss. I haven't seen them yet, guys. So uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that, whispers. Um, but a couple of years ago, FEMA, the NFIP, changed their rating system. Before that, flood insurance prices were going up 25% year over year for nine out of 10 of my clients. 25% uh, with no end in sight. And that's fine if you have a $250 policy, right? 10 years out, you're still OK. You're do you'll be OK. But if you have a $30,000 policy, and that's hit 25% year over year over year, um, yeah, that, that can put folks out of business. Um, so I think next, I'm going to go back to Deborah's first sheet here. Uh, I, I made a list of a few kind of key disaster-related uh, coverages that I wanted to address. And almost every one of them lines right up with Deborah's list. Um, so, so that makes sense. Uh, right at the top, uh, COVID and new pandemics. I've got some news. There's nothing we can do. Uh, when COVID hit, we got hundreds of calls at our agency. Uh, maybe thousands, uh, everyone was putting in claims. I did not hear an instance of any one of those getting paid out. Now that was with the way commercial lines policies were written before COVID. Since COVID, uh, all of the execs circled their wagons and made their policies absolutely airtight. So coverage for new pandemics, I'm extremely skeptical uh, that 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 type of coverage exists currently or will in the future. So that is on us and not insurance. Um, natural disasters, though, fires, uh, the wind. The wind will come. The hail will come. Uh, tornadoes will come. Uh, and we do have property coverage for that. Um, property rates are going up. And we have started to see some people, if they don't have a mortgage on their building, they've started making the decision to not carry that insurance. That's a spooky decision, guys. Please don't call me and ask that question. Uh, I'll do everything I can to talk you out of it. Um, but uh, again, I think we've reached the, the crest. We're, we're on the back end. I was seeing 20 to 40% year over year increases for the past couple of years. Maybe that's down into the teens. Uh, I'm not surprised if I see 10 to 12% uh, increases in property related premiums. What I would say to those of you who uh, do have buildings that you are responsible for having coverage on, make a plan for those building systems, for the replacement of those building systems. So electricity, plumbing, HVAC, all important. And they help with your insurability. If you're able to say to an insurance company, we just replaced the electrical panel last year, that will look better than we don't know when the last time the electrical panel was replaced, right? Most important on that list is the roof. Write it down. Anyone who, has, who is responsible for a building. Um, we have had multiple instances where insurance companies, and we'll see certain states are starting to step in and saying this is not legal, but not in Vermont, uh, not yet. Uh, there's aerial technology. And so say Liberty, Liberty Mutual, right? They've got s some sort of platform like Google Earth, and they take their snapshots of the roofs of their clients. And if they don't like what they see, they will non-renew. And as soon as they non-renew, it becomes that much more difficult to find another insurance carrier to take it, because you've got that, that mark on your, on your file. Um, so if you've got a 15-year-old roof, you're good. 
you're good, right? But start planning now. Don't wait until you're five years out uh, from that roof uh, needing to be replaced to start planning. Um, you know, a, a lot of times what I hear from insureds is, uh, you know, the, the roof is 23 years old, but it's got a 30 year life, so we're fine. You might be fine for the next seven years, you might be. Uh, in the eyes of the insurance company, maybe not, maybe not. Um, so anyway, that, that, that's my two cents on roofs. Please replace them. <laughs> Make them new if you can, and they're super expensive, right? Which is why I'm saying if you've got 15 years to plan, like start planning it now. Um, okay, uh, climate change, uh, well, back to flood. Uh, again, if, if you're with the National Flood Insurance Program, NFIP, the max building limit you can get is $500,000. Again, I see people uh, who take out that $500,000 limit 10 years ago, but they've paid down that mortgage, right? So now they only have $150,000 mortgage. The mortgage this is the only reason they have the coverage, and so they drop the limit to 150. And then that flood hits. Um, and I don't even know, right? I think you mentioned two million in losses. Uh, you need every penny of that $500,000. Do you understand what Nat's saying when he talks about, you know, most people have flood insurance related to their mortgage, their, the balance on there, everybody's got that, that the banks require an SBA IDLE loan now, if you have a disaster loan, requires that you are, you are fully insured to the max. Um, it used to be that they only required insurance for the amount of the loan, and now they're requiring insurance for the amount of the property if, it, if they can get it, because people were getting their properties destroyed and going back and back and back. So, you know, but what happens is, is, the, is the, as people don't have the loans anymore, they're letting the policies go. But, and I'm going to put a plug in and Nate's going to let me stop and yeah, do this. Please, please. Because I know that a lot of people get their coverage through associations. I know people get their coverage online. I can, the first thing I tell my clients is, you need to get a local insurance agent. You need to sit down and tell them everything you do and where you do it from. Because I think Nate had situations where people had insurance, but they had inventory in other places or operations in other places. They forget to tell the insurance agent that those other places weren't covered. So you need to tell people what you do, and you need to listen to the response of that insurance agent. And then when they send that lovely, friendly letter that says it's time to sit down and, re and look at your policy and make sure your coverages are in line, take that meeting. Yes. Thanks for the plug. You're welcome. Yes, please tell us. <laughs> uh, OK, moving down, employee issues and political climate. Uh, that lines right up with uh, employment practices liability. Uh, if anyone has employees, I would strongly encourage you to get employment practices liability coverage. So this, this is coverage that will uh, protect your business in, in the wake of uh, allegations of negligent hiring, firing, uh, racial discrimination, sexual discrimination. Uh, and, and the higher the, the political climate gets across the country, um, Ver Vermont is not isolated from that. Uh, and, and we certainly see uh, these employment practices liability claims come in. They're nasty, right? Racial discrimination, sex sexual discrimination, like awful. <laughs> and, and having that insurance coverage, having, uh, having that legal defense through the policy uh, can be a game changer. Um, let's see. And not writing an employee manual without these guys taking a look at it. Yeah, please. <laughs> these guys taking a look at it. And a contract HR person if you don't have one, if you don't have HR within your, because what people don't understand is when you write an employee manual, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, once that's written and you hand it out, that's what they have. Everything in there can be litigated from that point on. So you're doing it because you think it's going to be helpful, and it can be very, very helpful. I'm not saying don't have employee manuals. I'm saying don't pull one off the internet, don't get somebody's cousin to write it, unless they're an HR specialist and they know and they have a lawyer in the family that can also review it. Because that's a very important document. It's also one of those documents that needs to be revisited a lot. So Yeah, employee manuals are, are 
one of those areas where there are a lot of traps for the unwary. Mm -hmm. it, it's a good thing for businesses to be thinking about doing an employee manual. It's not uh, something that should be undertaken lightly. It's you're creating legal document, yeah. right? You're making promises to your employees, uh, and you're setting ground rules that all have legal implications. So that's one of those things that um, I wouldn't recommend. Recommend trying DIY. Yeah. Uh, get an employment lawyer. They're going to be able to. It's, it's. It doesn't have to be complicated, but you, you need to know how to avoid the traps. And tangential to that is uh, a, a coverage that's a bit sensitive but super important. I heard several of you say that you work with youth uh, abuse coverage, abuse and molestation coverage. Um, and this, this is one, right? I, I met with the executive director of a local theater a few weeks ago, and I brought this up because their policy currently excludes it. And, and I was trying to get at, do you have the exposure? Are you working with children? And his eyes kind of got big, and he's like, wow, you are in the business of worst case scenario. Yes, because we do see those claims. Uh, and, and they wait, right? Sometimes they hold on for decades. And I believe in Vermont, there is no statute on, of limitations, right? Uh, I believe that's a, I don't know if they had. yeah, I, I believe that's relatively new in the past few years. They've lifted that cap. Uh, and so we've seen an influx of claims from the 70s, the 80s, the 90s. Uh, in any case, having this coverage would protect your entity, your nonprofit entity, in the event that, say, one of your employees was alone with a child and later an allegation was brought. Whether founded or unfounded, the policy would at least provide that legal defense up front to help. Um, yeah, and, and a couple others. Oh, I, yeah, I guess it, this really lines right up, Deborah. Uh, right down the list, random acts of violence. Uh, Certainly, I'm thinking about you know theaters, whether we're talking about live live performance or uh, or film, uh, any place where where people are gathered on mass. Uh, different carriers name this coverage different things, but violent event response um, is an important one. So so if there was a violent event at your business or at one of your events. Uh, this would step in to, to try to make, make the entity whole, try to get you back on your feet. Um, so things like PR, right? If you have a theater and there's a violent event at that theater, it might be hard to, to have people get back in there to make them trust your space again, right? So the policy might step in there. If there's injury or death, the policy might step in to, to provide financial benefits there. Um, if there is trauma sustained, right, and people need, uh, need counseling after the fact, the policy might be able to respond in that way. So that's violent event response. And both your employees and the people who are at the venue. Sometimes also just considering these makes you do the plan. What is the plan? Not ha I mean, you got, I'm sure you all do have plans, but again, has it been updated? Have we, have we looked at it often enough so that we feel really comfortable if tomorrow this happened? Um, I, I, one of my fellow advisors in Maine had the bowling alley as a client where the shooting took place in Maine from now a couple of years ago. Um, they were not prepared at all. They, you know, they didn't wake up every morning and go, what do we do if some person comes in with a rifle and starts to shoot? But unfortunately, that's the tenor of the times at the moment. And so how do you prepare and how do you prepare your staff? And then, and Nate's right, how, how, what's the follow-up? What's the conversation you have? And you'll notice on the disaster preparedness checklist, one of the things is who's going to be the spokesperson? Because it's really important for a small business, for a nonprofit, to have one single spokesperson, not 50, not, not everyone out there talking. And it's not necessarily the executive director or the president or the owner of the company, because sometimes that's too much of a charge. So who should be the person who's out there having conversations with not your employees, which is internal, but any external conversation, vendors, customers, donors, who's having that conversation, and what is the message of that, and, and sticking to that. We're going to go back and
and study the Princess Kate thing. I swear to God we are, because when, when they said she was, gonna, she was going in for surgery and they would be updates when there was you know information and then they put out that ridiculous picture that had been photoshopped, mm. oh my God. And, you know, and she took the blame for that, classy lady, and then she came out and did that video saying I have cancer and now she's done this next video. It's gonna be studied by PR people for the rest of time in college classes in those because there's things about it that they did beautifully and there are things about it they really messed up because they didn't stick to the story and that was the problem in the beginning so that was one of the major problems so anyway okay w one more and then I'll pass the mic uh, crime crime coverage uh, and sp and th there's a whole list uh, of different types of sub coverages underneath that that larger umbrella term but employee theft specifically, um, we, we all see the headlines, right? Uh, I mean, it seems like every few months there's a headline saying like, uh, bookkeeper for Keen-based company, you know, uh, charged with stealing $400,000 from her employer. It happens. We see the claims. They're bad. Um, so I, I would strongly recommend having uh, employee theft or employee dishonesty coverage uh, on your on your business owners or commercial package policy. Uh, and again, back to like disaster preparedness, uh, if, if you have, if that bookkeeper swoops in and takes that money, right, and all of a sudden your operations have to cease for an undetermined period of time before the policy can respond, before the legal system can respond, um, yeah, it can get scary. So I, I think I'll leave it at that. I'm, ha I'm happy to answer any questions as we go, but I'm gonna pass the mic. All right. You're up. Sounds good. Um, I want to make sure we leave enough time for questions, but I'll give you a quick outline of what we can talk about in terms of the legal side. At a high level, when we're thinking about legal and we're thinking about disaster preparedness, resiliency, whatever you want to call it, um, a big part of this is just getting your house in order, doing the things that you really should be doing anyway as a business owner, right? So. A big piece of that, just gathering your documents, knowing where your agreements are, your lease, your contracts, um, if you have an employee manual, having that, having all these things in one place. So for starters, where is the stuff? Do you have copies of it? If you have a f one single file cabinet someplace that has all of these materials in it, and that file cabinet is sitting in a flood zone, mm -hmm. and it ends up going down river, what then? Do you have copies? Do you have pictures? Do you have, is it backed up in the cloud? Something, right? Cloud, 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 cloud. I had so many, I had so many clients in Irene whose um, external hard drive was sitting where? Next to their computer. I fondly say their computer is in the Bay of Fundy and their hard drive is in the Chesapeake Bay. And both are irretrievable. And they weren't backed up anywhere else. It is the single most important reason why idle loans, one of the most important reasons like, that the SBA doesn't give out idle loans, because it sounds like they give them to everybody and they don't, it's a very small percentage, but it's because the documentation is not intact. So, you need your documentation. And video, I've been told, is way better than pictures. So, yes? For? For insurance claims for legal purposes. Oh, sure. Yeah. So, video, if you can do it. Yeah, if a picture is worth a thousand words, a minute of video has got to yeah. be worth yeah. millions. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, right, so where are these materials? We can certainly get into some of the details about what to be looking for in contracts, what to be thinking about in terms of leases. Uh, we particularly want to talk about um, what's called force majeure, which, has to do, which is a specific sort of disaster clause that is found in a lot of different contracts. But before we get into, and then we can also talk, by the way, about like the BGAP um, program that's being offered by the state of Vermont, specifically for businesses that are impacted by the most recent floods. There's FEMA coverage, right? So there, there are disaster um, programs that are available to help redress um, you know, businesses or individuals that don't, that didn't have the insurance coverage they need or have some sort of uncompensated loss. So we can talk about that. Um, but I'm inclined to focus on contracts, leases, 
and the, the and like, the question I have for this group is, how many of these, how many in the room have a lease in connection with their business or even personally? Okay, so we've got a few leases. What about other agreements? Does anyone not have some kind of written agreement that's in connection with their business? Or for that matter, could be a verbal agreement, right? Um, those are a thing too. Ongoing promises that have been made either from or to the business to others um, that are, you know, that usually involve an exchange of money or goods or something like that. Does anyone not have a contract that's live in Is the business? Just for facilities or in general? In general. Oh. Yeah. Any kind of ongoing performance, right? Where somebody's relying on you. Probably that's a written contract, but it could, it could just be a verbal contract. Right? So I think everybody has something in that space. So let's start with contracts and just a quick discussion about what they are, what they're for, and how they factor when we think about disaster resilience and, and this kind of thing. So right, that can be vendor supplier contracts. It can be contracts with clients or customers. It can be contracts with collaborators. First of all, having a contract, having something in writing is super important. This is true generally. It's not just a disaster preparedness thing. Um, there are a lot of verbal contracts floating around in the world. There's nothing inherently wrong with doing business on a handshake, right? That can be done. It's done all the time. It is also not the best way to do it, largely because when people don't have a written agreement, they don't they are, they're literally not on the same page often regarding what the deal specifically is. And so one of the big benefits of putting it down in writing is to make sure that everybody has thought through what the relationship is going to be. What are the promises? When do I have to perform? How much am I paying? When do I have to pay you? Um, you know, these kinds of details can easily get lost when we're just looking at uh, verbal agreements. But when they go down on a page, everybody gets on the same page, to use that turn of phrase. And usually, it results in some kind of discussion going on back and forth between the parties. Right? Like, oh, well, I hadn't thought about that. You know, um, that timeline doesn't work for me, actually. You know, uh, I, I'm going to need more time for, for my performance of my piece of this contract. Oh, really? Oh, well, hmm, well that, that changes something for me, right? And this back and forth happens, and by the time people put the ink at the bottom of the page, um, there's a better understanding than there would have been. So, you know, part one, have the contract in writing. When it comes to contracts that have ongoing performance obligations, right, so um, you've got a supplier of widgets and you've got a buyer of widgets, right? And the buyer wants to buy 100 widgets per year at a certain price, and the supplier will supply 100 widgets per year at that price, right? That's the contract, that's the deal. That is where disaster preparedness really sort of comes alive because promises have now been made that over the course of the next year, we're gonna perform, right? I'm gonna make the widgets and send them to you, you're gonna send me the money for the widgets. That is where disasters come into contracts because we're all, we've made promises about the future, but we don't know the future, right? And as we've seen, sometimes in the future, there's a flood or a fire or a pandemic. That is where what's called force majeure clauses come in. And they are common but not universal in contracts of this nature. Basically, what a force majeure clause does is it says if there is something unforeseen, often called acts of God, or you know, very often it's spelled out, flood, fire, um, civil unrest, right, war, things like this. If those things happen, if one of those acts of God or force majeure clauses comes into being during the terms of the contract, then somebody according to whatever you've said in the contract, doesn't have to perform the duties that they would normally have had to perform, right? 
So it's clarifying the risk landscape and it's letting the parties know, okay, if one of these force majeure acts of God things happens during the performance time of this contract, then what, right? So maybe the maker of the widget says, look, if my widget factory gets blasted by a tornado, I'm not gonna be able to provide these for you. I'm not gonna be able to perform and, and deliver my promise that I'm making under this contract. But I won't be in breach of the contract and you can't sue me under the contract because it was beyond my control, it was force majeure, right? And so people can and do sometimes argue about, well, did the particular thing that happened activate the force majeure clause or not? But if it's something like a flood or a tornado or something like that, that's force majeure, right? That's classic. Can you be really specific? This happened a lot in, in Ferry after the flood with, with businesses and their leases. So can you just be really specific about what happens in a lease situation? Yeah, so yeah, leases are just a different kind of contract. So, you know, in general, what does force majeure does? It suspends the obligations of somebody for some period of time, right? And usually there's going to be some there's going to be some contours around that, right? You have to use your best efforts to get back up and running, and if you don't, you know, if you just throw up your hands and give up and walk away, then maybe you're still going to end up in breach and so on, right? And it doesn't just make the contract evaporate usually. It just suspends the obligation of the parties to perform under the contract. So a lease, right? What is it? That's just a special kind of contract that has to do with real estate, right? And it says, you know, lessor is uh, the owner of the real estate. Lessee wants to use the real estate and inhabit it for some reason, either for uh, to live residential or for commercial reasons. So force majeure clauses can find their way into leases, right? But there are also other things that can be done in the context of a lease. Um, and we're gonna talk about that. When it comes to leases though, the big question is gonna be, okay, if something crazy has happened, usually in connection with the actual premises, right? That's what we care about. Those, that's the goods in this contract. It's the place and the right to occupy the place. So if the place is damaged or destroyed, then what happens, right? That can take the form of, of a force majeure clause or it can take the form of just a separate piece of the, the agreement that says, this place has to be fit for habitability, it has to be fit for purpose, right? And so that's, that can, that's, that's not necessarily a force majeure clause, but it's the same kind of thing, right? Something important to say about leases, especially for this group, there is a stark difference between a commercial lease and a residential lease. And it's really important to understand that they are very different animals. So usually when most of us think about a lease, we think about a residential lease, right? Because that's by far the most common kind of lease where it's you've got somebody renting an apartment, they're gonna live in it, right? Residential leases have a whole framework of protections built up mostly for the renters um, by the state, right? So there's all kinds of protections for renters. There's a, there's a legal framework put in place by the state of Vermont, which helps mostly renters. Um, and you can build on top of that framework with your residential lease, but you cannot eliminate any of those protections by agreement with the landlord, right? They just exist. Commercial leases are not like that. Okay, commercial leases, the deal is what's on the page. With very few exceptions, whatever the, the agreement says, that's the deal. And that's the whole deal, and there are no promises beyond that, right? So commercial leases are not subject to this, you know, patchwork or framework of state laws which would protect either the landlord or the, the tenant. Um, commercial leases are just what's written on the page, pretty much, okay? so. Even more than a residential lease, I, I think it would always it would be a good idea to have a lawyer look at your residential lease, especially if it's long term, but I realize most people don't do this, and okay. When it comes to a commercial lease though, I think it's, it's triple important to have a lawyer look at it because you don't have those protections from the state. We really, we recommend that every single time because 
there are so many things, and I think what people don't understand when you sign a lease, people think about, all you think about when you're doing your planning is that monthly rent payment. But the day you sign the lease, if you sign a three-year lease, you owe, the, you owe now, you've promised, you're going to pay the amount of the three-year lease. And if you have a local landlord, that can sometimes be easily discussed, and they can let you out of the lease, and there are, you know, there are notifications, and there are things. But I've had, I've had businesses that have landlords from out of state who are like, nope, you signed the lease, it was for three years, I don't care that you're a year and a half into it, I want this dollar amount. And by law, they have to pay it. So understanding that there are more implications than just whatever that monthly payment is, I think gets you to understand that you need to look at it with more care and more detail. Yep. <clears throat> yeah, I agree with that. Um, when we think about damage from unexpected events in particular, we talked about this idea of habitability or fitness for purpose. So this raises you know, an example from the July 2023 floods. I had a commercial client um, whose property was damaged by the flood. And the property was not, um, not condemned, right? There were specific provisions in the lease for if the property is condemned. It wasn't condemned. And the client's part of the property was second floor, so it wasn't directly impacted by the floodwaters. Only the first floor was and the basement. And the landlord came around and said, all fixed up, you're ready to go. You can go back in now. Please start paying your rent again, right? But the client was saying, yeah, maybe that's true, but there's dust. It's everywhere. It's thick. It covers the surfaces every day and night. Because this is how it was in Barrie and in Montpelier. After the flood, there's river mud everywhere. That stuff dries up. Cars and trucks are driving all around doing their work. And that all just gets put in the air, right? And so there was, I mean, this entire building was just loaded with dust. So it would have been nice in this context to have something in the lease about fitness for purpose, right? Like you, the landlord, are promising us, the tenants, that this place will be fit for purpose. We're using it in this way. We're running our offices out of it. We're doing this kind of business out of this space. And this is something that can be thought about in connection with a lease. What do we need the property that we're leasing to do for us? And what would get in the way of that, particularly when we think about things like disasters, floods, wildfire, smoke, whatever, right? These kinds of things. And then ask the landlord, um, can we get some promises that this place will be kept in, this, in, a, in a condition that enables us to keep running the business, right? And if there's something specific that you need, you can ask for it. Another thing to remember about commercial leases that sort of separates them from residential leases is that in general, negotiation is more okay and is kind of more normal Right? It's very typical that commercial leases are going to be negotiated. There are usually lawyers looking at them from both sides. And um, it's not very unusual for most commercial landlords to get some kind of pushback on some piece of the lease or it's someone who says, well, I, I need to add this or no, that clause doesn't work for me or I need to make this change. You know, with a lot of residential leases, especially with big apartment buildings or whatever, it's sort of take it or leave it. You know, that's the deal. Um, and a commercial landlord can say that too, right? They can always say, no, take it or leave it. That's the deal. I'm not changing it. But it's, it's pretty common, in, I think, in residential lease situations for landlords to just say, take it or leave it. It's not super common in, in commercial leases. By the way, it's also, most leases have a period of time, right? Two years, three years, one year, sometimes it's long, 10 years or whatever. When the lease comes up, that's an opportunity to renegotiate. And so if you have looked at your lease and you're like, hmm, no force majeure clause in there, no protection whatsoever if this place just doesn't work for me anymore because there's been you know, damage, um, then when the lease comes up, that's an opportunity to go to the landlord and say, hey, as long as we're re-upping, um, can we add this force majeure clause or something else? So I'll pause there. We've got. 15 minutes or so remaining. Questions?
what's alive for the group here. I'll just make a comment about being thoughtful about insurance limits, property limits, and how much your coverage is. Uh, we all thought that our, we had a $400,000 plus policy that we all thought would be sufficient. Sure. <laughs> um, and obviously it was not. And now we're thinking, well, we have an $8 million uh, policy on the whole building. But look at how expensive everything has gotten. Um, you know, construction costs, all the permitting requirements, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so we're thinking about, like, let's really, like, let's get an independent, once we're done with all the work, let's get an appraisal on the building and make sure that that $8 million is the right number. Because we don't want to be in a position where there's a fire, there's a, what I, I guess not flood specifically, but there's a fire, you know, something happens to the building. Could, could we really rebuild the whole building to the same standard for that amount of money? The answer is probably no, I'm imagining. Um, but we've always just, like, you know, I, we've all agreed, as the board's agreed, the, the agent's like, oh, yeah, that'll be fine, that's fine, whatever. But, like, this was kind of eye-opening. Um, so just, like, be concerned about it. Uh, great. Great to hear it. If you can't afford uh, to get a builder's estimate for your building to see how much it would cost to rebuild, make it happen. Uh, right, I mean, a few years ago, the, we were writing insurance policies at like $180 a square foot, right? And now the bare minimum seems to be around 225 And what I see is most of our clients carry 225 to maybe 275 uh, per square foot for rebuild costs. Uh, but of course, I'm sure you guys have heard stories personally, right? Like we have family friends who just priced out building just a new pretty normal middle class house and it was priced out at like $640 a square foot. So never mind a commercial building. Um, something I think that's great. Thank you. Good luck building a new building for even 300 bucks a square foot right now. Yeah. They, or, or maybe ever again. Ever. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because the problem is that from a market standpoint, if you can, if you get that money for your, for lumber, you're going to get that money for lumber. You know, and we also know that the supply chain issues and a lot of the things that happened, I talk about long-term business COVID because we're still having employee issues. We're still having um, supply chain issues. We're still having ridiculous cost of goods sold issues. I had a client last week who gets their product that makes, that is the basis of their product. They were getting it from South America and drought and problems there meant they had to move to getting it from Africa. <clears throat> they got in and got it from Africa. They found a supplier. And then because all the other people who were also in South America followed them to, to Africa, the price of that product went up. Uh, one time hit with a 30-day notice, 50%. And all of a sudden, the business model has to be completely different. That's what we're talking about in, in being nimble, because what do you do? They can't pass a 50% increase in cost of goods sold onto their clients. They won't survive. So they've got to change their model. They can't use as much of that product as they have been using, and yet that's what they're called. So it's like it's a very interesting situation to watch all of these things continue. So. I think just knowing these guys are here and knowing how to use them and again in that pause and when you're preparing for the disaster going, do I have enough insurance to to cover you know these kinds of instances and problems and could I possibly rebuild? And then it's like, well then how do we change what we offer? And how, or how do we fundraise to, you know, how do you how do you get people and what we're hearing on the fundraising side, and again, we, I don't work with nonprofits anymore, is that nobody wants to fund infrastructure. They all want to fund programs. Because that's, you know, that's where the good stuff is. But the fact is, if you don't have the infrastructure, you can't deliver the programs. So you guys are kind of between a rock and a hard place. I understand that. So what else can we answer for you? Or yes, in the back. Hi. Hi. You brought up two that I was just wondering if you could elaborate on a little more. When you mentioned the dust, 
I was thinking back to the clause that you had mentioned about act of God and or, or beyond circumstances you can control. So does the dust become part of that? Or is there really something in the design of the building that therefore to define it as a usable space versus just habitable space? I mean, we're playing with the words on this one. So I'm just curious about that. And then there's another one just like it. Let's say you sit up on the hill by the granite quarries and your production doesn't get affected at all by the flood. But when the railroad tracks washed out, it's the transportation that gets affected as far as your product can't get to its customer, which you contracted for. Um, and there's a reverse side of that, which is, can you get the product in order to make what you are selling as a product because somebody else flooded? So any chance of elaborating on how those kind of interact with each other? Yeah, yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. So on the first question, this is... Um, I'll just make another plug for lawyers, but you know, so forgive me for that. But this is why it's a good idea to have a lawyer look at this. And by the way, I'll make a plug for our program while I'm at do, it. Do that. Do so, that one first. Yeah, we are. So at the Vermont Law and Graduate School, we have the Small Business Law Center, and I'm here on behalf of that center. And we have a program where we'll do an educational consult for you. It's 45 minutes, whatever questions you have. We will try to answer them, although we cannot give legal advice in that context, we can give you legal information that's relevant to your situation. And then after the consult, you can be referred to a lawyer where you get to work with that lawyer for 10 hours at no cost to you. The lawyer gets paid what we call a low bono rate. It's a lot lower than a typical lawyer's rate, but it's a lot better than a sharp stick in the eye. And so the lawyers gonna get 10 hours to work with you and address whatever it is you need, right? So to look at your actual lease, to look at a force majeure clause, if there's one in there, and talk it over with you. Does this meet your needs? Might it, might it not meet your needs, especially if the lease is up for review because you haven't signed it yet or it's coming up for renewal? You can, you know, the lawyer can propose some different language or whatever like that. So that 10 hours of legal help is super helpful if you're trying to kind of build in some resiliency around your business. Um, and the, and the 45-minute consult allows you to narrow the questions so that when you go and get that 10 hours, you're not wasting any of that 10 hours right. you already framing know what you the want issues to because you already know what you want to ask. Like, for instance, I just had a client who wants a motel who had a reservation. You'll probably remember this one. Had a reservation for two people with a lot of questions about how many people can visit in a room, how big is the room, um, and he's like, are they gonna have a party? It turns out they were coming from New Jersey and they were having a planned assisted death. Under our laws, you can now come in from out of state. They came in, they brought a hospice nurse with them. He didn't know any of this until after. They brought a hospice nurse with them. They had family visit. They, it, they delivered the, end of life process and then they left the a lot of the medical equipment and they called and said just so that you know it there's going to be um, there's going to be an, an ambulance and then and then the the funeral parlor is coming to pick up this body and then look okay. in a motel where you could see you know it wasn't like it was a great thing in a motel and, it, and they and they're like how do we how do we deal with that in the future we don't want to be we don't want to be unsympathetic but at the same time because they got a call a week later from another hospice saying can are you are you open 
for having this happen. They were like, I don't think we want to be known as the place to come in southern Vermont for hospice deaths, you know, for these kinds of assisted deaths. I don't think that's what's going to make the rest of our customers feel very comfortable. So they went to the law school and they had a session and now they're going to get 10 hours of legal work so that they can have some language that they can use and their reservation staff can use that at least they've got some things in place. So I've been loath to interrupt this very interesting Q&A session, but we're actually more yeah. than 10 minutes over. Oh, we are. So I want to give folks time to get to the next session. The next session does start at 3. So uh, check out your guide. The next session here will be um, Jesse Keel from the uh, NEDCC. We'll be talking about maintaining an effective disaster plan. And I'm sure that our guests would be willing to answer any questions that you have here for the next few minutes, right? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. Great. Thank you all so much. This was very informative and really interesting. So let's give a round of applause.